on the beach in Hawaii. Welcome back. It's smoking and Toastin', and we are so thrilled to have you uh, hanging out with us on the program today and uh, enjoying show number 142. Uh, Caleb from Backfish, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thanks for and, having me. And thanks for bringing uh, ice-cold beers. I, I, I He brought these in from the... Uh, uh, from the cooler uh, during the break, and I uh, actually used my fingers and touched them, and I said, "You can't tell the mountains are blue. You the, can't tell you, without you, so having you, mountains. You don't trust the this, the touching and the actual and, tactile method yeah. you're using is flawed. Okay, All right. I understand. <laughs> what if what if your fingers are particularly <coughs> cold? Then you wouldn't tell that the can's cold. Or what so if, you're saying without the mountains, you I'm just, just no way to know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I hope I hope our listeners actually pick up on how ridiculous I think yes. the, the, the mountains are. I have a feeling they probably do. <laughs> I have a feeling. Well, you so. know, some people are very literal, and, 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 and that's not that's not anything bad. It's just some people are way more literal than I am. That's, you know? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, I'm not one of those people. Uh, Uprocks is a very uh, very cool uh, website that does you know some very interesting articles, some interesting lists. Uprocks is U P R O X X because that's the way you would have to spell it, uh, particularly if you had one hand on a beer trying to figure out if the mountains were blue or not. Um, but they've done a very interesting list of uh, what they consider to be the top independent American whiskeys, and I thought we'd review this list because I thought uh, it'd be interesting. I don't know. If you've had all of these, Ian, but I suspect you've had a few of them, and you'd find it interesting. Uh, the the editor's pick was Burnside Oregon Oaked Bourbon. It's a uh, really nice sort of pale blue label, and I don't believe I've ever seen mm-hmm. this one before uh, So from Oregon. So we'll have to look and, and get, uh, get our hands on some of that. The next one, however, I believe we've seen. It's Garrison Brothers Texas Straight Small Batch Bourbon Whiskey on my from shelf. Garrison Brothers in Texas. That was such a good. Th- those guys were guests on the show. Wow, on my shelf. That's that was so a, good. That was a great show. <laughs> it was a great show. You know, Caleb. Uh, people occasionally ask us <coughs> what it was that you know made us start doing the show, and the mm-hmm. answer is really quite simple, uh, and that is. Samples, samples. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a whole that's we're, the whole motivating factor. Yeah, we're 142 episodes in. Samples, samples. Um, so uh, the next one is Koval, K O V A L, Koval single barrel bourbon from Illinois. Uh, does that ring a bell with you at all, Ian? Mm-mm. Koval, don't I, know that I, one. I, it looks, it doesn't look familiar to me, but uh, but it does look delicious. Uh, New York Distilling's Ragtime Rye. These are all independent American mm-hmm. whiskey makers. So. Uh, but uh, New York Distilling's Ragtime Rye from New York. I've not seen this before the article either. Uh, then we come to one that I have seen, but I don't remember where. It's Cedar Ridge, Iowa Bourbon from Iowa. Mm, not familiar with that. You know, one. I don't think of Iowa as a big, uh, you know, big bourbon place, but perhaps. Well, you know, until a few years back, no one thought of Texas that way either. (coughs) And that is changing, thanks to people like Garrison Big time, yeah. Absolutely. American Oak Single Malt Westland Distillery from Washington. Uh, Now, I do think of the the Pacific Northwest as being a, a... a hot spot not only for brewing but also for uh, uh, for micro distilling and for uh, craft mm-hmm. distillers. So that doesn't surprise me that they are represented here. How about Templeton Rye? Oh, from Templeton Iowa. Rye. Yeah, yeah. But that's we both had that. Uh, Port Cask finished Virginia Highland whiskey from Virginia. I don't think of Virginia as having Highlands, but uh, that sounds good though. It does sound good. And it's a really nice looking bottle too for what that's worth. And finally. Balcones Baby Blue. Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. So props to uh, two two distilleries we've had on the mm-hmm. show who made this list, Balcones and, and uh, Garrison Brothers. Yeah. And that Balcones is good. Now, um, when, when we had them on the show, I wound up taking home the bottle that was just their kind of like the regular bourbon, the mm-hmm. the one of the less expensive bottles. That's, uh, that's one of my go-tos. Like that bourbon is so easy to to just go to it's got that cinnamon yeah. vibe to it it's just it's just I really think I terrific. have a little bit left of the rye that Oh yeah, you took the rye. Yeah, I remember rye, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, samples, uh-huh. yeah, Caleb. That's samples. What uh, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Speaking of samples, we have some samples in front of us here. Are we uh, ready to try some cheap sunglasses? Yes, you we know, are. I yeah. kind of wish we had the song queued up. <coughs> uh, yeah, I know. It's you know, uh, one can only assume that this is. Uh, uh, in homage to uh, that little old band from Texas, uh, ZZ Top, that did the Cheap Sunglasses song. That's a great song. It really oh, it is. is too. Yeah, yeah it, it really is. And it's actually from the period of their um, 
their development or their uh, their fame when they were getting huge airplay for legs and some of the things that you think of as more pop and maybe less you know authentic ZZ Top. But the reality is that uh, that's that's just one of their most ZZ songs of all time. Oh yeah, it's it, very it really is. So now you uh, have one there in your hand. Uh, Are we going to do this the same time? Stereo. Oh. It's stereo. You ready? Three. One or three? Go ahead. Two, one. Wow, I like that. That was we we use only the uh, the most authentic uh, and expensive sound effects. When, yeah, shows, whenever it's available sure to us. Was, Hand opening in stereo. Sure, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I wanted to point out that Brian also put up a, a question. He's asking, uh, and this is pertaining to the, the I think, our previous conversation with the uh, cold-activated can. He said, mm-hmm. is this a Vortex can? Oh, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> yeah, because, that. you know, nothing makes beer taste better than swirling it around <laughs> when you're pouring it. Through a bottleneck that's this long, by the way, it has a huge way, effect on it. By the way, I, their marketing worked. I bought one. The, the marketing work, the Vortex did not. The beer just poured right over it. It was the stupidest thing ever. I, I, I don't get it. Um, uh, let me ask you this, Caleb. Cheap Sunglasses uh, is uh, basically labeled as an American pale ale. What is the difference in brewer's terms between an American pale ale and something that would be classified as an IPA or an American IPA? Where? When does India uh, figure into the description, or does it? Well, um, is this one mine? Awesome. Uh, with this uh, pale ale and an IPA, there's yeah. What's the difference way, between a pale ale? And there's an IPA? somewhat a gray area in between. <coughs> Makes sense. Um, marketing, mm-hmm. uh, but this one, uh, this pale ales are to me are a little less bitter. Right. They're more fruit forward hops. Um, I don't think of them as being. As as heavy hop, like you don't you don't think of a double or an imperial pale ale. I mm-hmm. suppose they could exist. The alcohol con- yeah, content right. also right. Um, pale ale is going to be just a little bit less than an IPA, mm-hmm. and uh, and that does make sense. Like you think of like the sort of classic pale ale that you think of would be Sierra Nevada, which right. t- Sierra Nevada pale ale, which to me tastes very much like an IPA. Like I don't I don't really taste a lot of. Different, or it tastes like some of the IPAs that I like the most. I guess is is a good way to say it. It's a little citrusy, and it's got some of that nice bitter without being overly hopped. But this is, um, first of all, very refreshing for for a pale. This, uh, unlike most pale ales, this has kind of a malty finish to it. Well, Usually, you taste malty up front. This has malty <coughs> on the finish, kind of on the finish where mm-hmm. the bitters are, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and a little bit of hop snap to it at the same time, which yes, it is does. really an interesting combination. Um, I like this. This is this is a lot of fun. I think of pale ales maybe as being a little crisper than IPAs. Does that make any sense, yeah, or is this can, just where, where my head goes? Um, no, it's definitely. I, I could see a pale ale like um, having a nice crisp finish. Mm-hmm. IPAs as well. Um, IPA is going to be hopped at a heavier rate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and have a little more alcohol. Uh, it does say here that it's brewed with uh, El Dorado and Mosaic hops, no rhinestones. <laughs> exactly. So, no rhinestones. <laughs> so that's good to know. Um, this is how how long ago did the brewery release uh, cheap sunglasses? Do you know? I'm I'm not exactly sure. Whenever the beer came out, um, you mentioned there was an IPA in the lineup that kind of got replaced exactly by this. By right? this. Uh huh. Um, I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I'm not sure exactly. I know this batch, um, just got canned last week. <laughs> no <laughs> so, wonder, no wonder it tastes yeah, so super different. fresh. Yeah. I have oh, to yeah. tell you, I'm going to have to go back and forth between the all y'all and cheap sunglasses to see what I like better. Interesting. I'm pouring hard to see what happens here. But, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this, this beer, we use, uh, the more fruit forward mm-hmm. hops. Right. There's, there's Citra and Mosaic, right? Mm-hmm. Citra mm-hmm. and Mosaic, El Dorado. It, let me ask you a question about hops. Um, is has the explosion in craft beer made good quality citra hops? Let's say harder to get because it's used in so much in stuff. Yes. everything. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or, or are they just growing more and every and the demand's being met? Um, no, the de- they uh, the demand is way above what they're uh, they're putting out. They uh, sometimes it's a scavenger hunt to try to find some of these hops. Wow. So as a as a brewer, does that put you in a position where you may have something that you really want to make and release, but you have to wait because the 
the hops the that you want just you can't there. source them at that point in time exactly it's, wow that's um, interesting i never thought of that but that i bet that does happen especially with the new hop craze like mm-hmm. the the hazy ipas and things that are just massively right, we're using massive like, amounts mm-hmm. of hops yeah they're um, they're really it's the like Citra and El Dorado are really hard to find right now. And can those only be grown in certain areas? In other words, you can't just find a new farmer in Del Rio, Texas, can't to grow Citra hops or whatever. El Dorado seed and toss it in right. your backyard. <laughs> well, the uh, actually um, with the hops, some of them are trademarked. Like um, oh, right. only so certain you... farms they they have the rights to grow them. Oh, wow. So you know, when I was a kid, my mom had a garden behind the house like all the time we always lived uh, in a place where she would have a little bit of a backyard and could have a garden and she would grow corn and potatoes and tomatoes and and you know green onions and things like that and i would always have to go weed the garden and and you know water and stuff if i if she had just grown hops i'd have been so much more interested <laughs> you know i'd have been i'd have been so into that whole uh, hops or maybe like uh wrapper tobacco you know what i'm saying like i would have been like Mom, this is awesome. Instead, I you was know, just like, do I really have to weed the garden? We had that a little bit, and uh, my mom always tried to go uh, grow rhubarb, but we'd just chew on it. We'd, <laughs> we'd go out there and break a stalk and yeah. chew. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I just, I'm just fascinated by the whole. You know, we got to uh, visit in Honduras the uh, tobacco farms for uh, JRE and Aladino, and you know, it was it was fascinating, like looking at farming in just a completely different way from what I was used. I actually grew up in a small town, as a farming community, mm-hmm. so you know, we farmed peanuts and all kinds of stuff in in this uh, area where I lived. Uh, but I never had the kind of respect for it I did in mm. Honduras in the tobacco fields, right. and I, I have a feeling I would be just the same way about. Ops. Like, mm-hmm. how cool would that be to uh, to be well, able to see? I think knowing the end result too raises the interest level. Of course, I've actually course. given uh, growing hops a try. It's very hard to do in the Texas heat. I bet. I <laughs> yeah. bet. Yeah, yeah. They I, did great until about mid July, and then <laughs> they just uh, turned brown. How long does it does it take from say the time you plant a small hop plant or a plant uh, from the seed? Before it gets to the point where it would be or it's harvestable. growing a harvestable hops. Well, uh, hops are uh, planted um, with rhizomes, kind of like uh, what how wine vines are. Okay, right. um, and they plant so them. So it's over time. Then. Early March, they try to do it like around the last frost, mm-hmm. and they're normally grown in the Pacific Northwest. Right, and um, they harvest them August September. So around then, you'll see a lot of breweries that'll put fresh hop beers out. So cooler and wetter right, environments. Right. Mm-hmm. And those uh, single hop, dry hop type uh, uh, beers that are like those very new hops that have just been harvested mm-hmm. come in. That's fascinating stuff. Yeah, uh, brewers will have those uh, hops like overnighted in and mm-hmm. get them in the kettle like days after they've been mm-hmm. picked in the fields. That, uh, that makes that makes some sense. Like if, if it's in your backyard, you might as well take advantage of it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so cheap sunglasses is this your flagship at this point for backfish? I would say it's it's one of our it's one of our best sellers, if not yeah. the best seller. Yeah. What about uh, what about Defying Gravity? Is this more of a specialty or is this uh... Defying Gravity is our double IPA? Yeah. So um, it's gonna be a little higher on the alcohol level. It's a uh, it's a different hop profile. Yeah. It's more piney. Right, and, um, as opposed to the um, citrusy, this is more of a dank. citrusy, in citrusy, the, in the and, the like this one's more dank, right, citrus, right. and uh, Defying Gravity is going to be more of that pine. It's got some uh, classic hops in there, like Chinook. Right. Now that the uh, the sort of uh, hazy and and juicy IPA craze has sort of, I, I don't know that it's fair to say it's died down, but it's it's no longer a craze. It's now about how it just affects. The mm-hmm. IPA scene as a whole is did that kind of move into a place where it's a hotter thing than the uh, you know the the more uh, piney hop type thing um, or or is which, which is there more appetite for you think in the IPA community? I think there's appetite for everything because different people like different things. Right. Um, the hazy IPA and we all call it a craze, but mm-hmm. so many breweries are doing it now. Yeah. I, it's really, you can't call it a craze anymore. Every, when everyone's doing it, you know? right, right, exactly. Go ahead. Ooh, ooh, that that sounded rife with promise. <laughs> and that that's another thing in our tap room. Um, we release some small batch 
like IPAs and things mm-hmm. that you can mm-hmm. only get in the tap room. That uh, always fascinates me, and and I but I'm always worried that I will find my new favorite beer. I, I'm an IPA guy. Ian's more like the you know the darker beer, stouts and porters guy. He's a big fan of barley wine. I enjoy those things too, but but IPA is kind of where my heart is, and. Uh, I'm always afraid I'll go to the tap room, I'll find my new favorite beer, and then I'll only be able to get it like for a few weeks or a few months. Well, that's whenever uh, you uh, talk to the bartender and you tell them how much you like it. Yeah, yeah. And then they uh, get they get a hold of uh, someone like me, and uh, we make sure that that uh, feedback gets listened to, and you might find it on the shelves. So, what is the what is the process there? Like like how. If you put something out in the tap room, you're thinking of it as a tap room only or limited release, mm-hmm. and it gets like a great response. Like, what? How big would that have to be to make you guys decide? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go into production on this uh, in in cans and release it to the stores. I'm. It's it's really if we get a good response, like we've we've had uh, the last last week for instance, we released uh, all y'all with uh, Blackberry. It nice. did extremely well. Nice. I think um, we put out 30 gallons of it, and it kicked in less than two days. Wow. Wow. That's and so cool, though. So that one's definitely going to be back. Um, and, you know, that kind of perks us up. Mm-hmm. You see that. Right. You get you excited know? about that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then, absolutely. you know, that's how we uh, we kind of uh, consider on what we're going to put out to them, you know, in, in our production right. line. So I'm going to assume that Defying Gravity is a NASA reference. I don't know that it is, but I'm going to guess that it is with uh, with you having a good ZZ Top reference for all y'all. Um, Just a little uh, Spaceman helmet. Yeah, a little Spaceman yeah. helmet. I like it. I um, it. This is a, now, Ian, I know that this, this style of IPA is less to your taste than other styles. So talk to me about how this Well, uh, you, you say you. that. Okay, so I, I am less IPA than I am generally the maltier beers. However, double IPAs and bigger IPAs I generally like better than I like not so double IPAs. Interesting. Um, the, because, like, uh, a brewer will do like this. This is not, this is not a bitter pine cone stuck in your teeth kind of flavor Mm -hmm. that's the thing that drives me nuts and Mm -hmm. uh and i think a lot of that is the uh the 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 last hop that they do the the dry hopping Mm -hmm. on the end that that makes it so bitter um and this to me has a great finish to it and i don't know what the uh abv is on this it it has a little bit of a boozy feel but it's double i want to say i'm not eight I think it's about seven and a half, actually. It's, okay. This is really good, though. But I like the finish on this because it doesn't leave you with that pine cone. Overly pine cone. Bitterness survive, that yeah. just sticks to the, yeah, it just makes you, uh, you know. The beer, it, this one, actually, it, it washes over your palate. You get it, yes. and then it's gone. And that's and so I like this because of that. But you definitely um, get the uh, get the hoppy right up in your face flavor. Mm-hmm. But in this, it's a little more perfumey in a really nice way. It's not... Well, it's not just. I think that when the um, when the big IPA craze hit before the hazy thing, when it, all of a sudden everybody was trying to make the biggest and hoppiest IPAs they could make, there was a, a maybe a subset of IPA fans that were like just the hoppier the better. So yeah. everybody was trying to out hop everybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm glad that that trend has subsided. Well, and now people are making big IPAs. That have some balance to them, and this is a perfect. This example is a very balanced yeah. IPA, mm-hmm. and I will tell you, if you're put off by IPAs that are too hoppy, to the point where it's it's just too bitter, this is not that. This is this is one that I would put in my uh, in my stable of IPAs that I that yeah. I go to, right? Because of that, whereas generally I avoid certain ones that are just that are just too you know too bitter, too pine cone, too yeah. floral. Like right. and not uh, and not balanced. This right here has a lot of balance. That defying gravity has a big malt backbone. That's a large part of it too. Right, because you're you're really a malt guy, I think, yes. at heart. Uh, whereas I might be a hops guy, you're a malt guy, and that I've noticed that when we have beers where the malt is a larger part of the profile, that you have a tendency to like those definitely, and, and, definitely. and feel like they are, they are to your palate. But definitely, uh, and and whereas like an IPA that's way hop balance especially on the tail end you'll tend to appreciate i'll tend to immediately back off of 
Right. right. So this is not that though. This has a finish that that I don't care if you if you don't even particularly like IPAs. This this has a finish right. that Absolutely. probably fixes that problem for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I I think it's delicious. Do you have a, a favorite Ian out of the four that we've sampled here today? Mm. It's a tough one. I think cheap sunglasses is my. Uh, my knee-jerk reaction, but I'd have to do some more research between all y'all and cheap sunglasses. Those think, are great. Yeah, I think cheap sunglasses would be the one that I would, and already is, but it would be the one that I would say I'll drink that one the most mm-hmm. out of out of what w- was here. But uh, Defying Gravity is one of those, like, I need a couple of those in the fridge at all yeah. times. And and the others are, with with summer coming, like, they they really are perfect. Or summer, it's not coming, it's so, here, you know? Yeah. So. You know, you say, I, I'm, not, I'm not the hop guy a lot of times, and I get that. But in my refrigerator, if you look in there, there's almost always some kind of large hoppy beer. It's either mm-hmm. Ghost in the Machine now. Right. Or Dogfish Head 90 Minute, and this will be in that rotation now, nice, or nice. an Arrogant Bastard, or well, something like that. But that's, I'm if you tell listen you, Caleb, to that list. That's high praise. What he just said right there, you're talking some of the yeah. but most if you listen respected to that list, IPAs those are out there. Very balanced IPAs. Well, of course Even they though are, they're yeah. all kind of on the bigger side of IPA, they're very mm-hmm. balanced IPAs. And that, to me, that's what makes a, a good IPA. It's not just slamming hops in your face. I was going to mention, I got really excited at HEB. I went. Uh, grocery shopping with my wife and so once she gets tired of me like helping her with the produce you know uh she'll go why don't you go choose you some beer go look at beer so so i go around the corner to the beer and they have the you know the individual cans you Uh know where you get the whole six pack so i always like to try uh different things and sometimes get some beers for the show or whatever uh and i got really excited because they had the dogfish head 60 minute in the in the make your oh, own you can six grab pack. A couple. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll make a whole six pack of 60 minute because you can't buy <laughs> dogfish head 60 minute for like a six pack for like 9.99. That's that's <laughs> that's not happening. So uh, I'm I'm gonna do that. So anyway, so I got some 60 minute. That's good. But the 90, I think, is their sort of crowning it. Uh, well, I think I think like if you're gonna take <coughs> a pinnacle of the style, I think Dogfish Head 90 Minute is one of the best IPAs that has ever been made. Well, that one, the Two Hearted Ale, is right Lone there. Lone Pine Yellow Rose, don't forget. Um, Lone Pine Yellow mm-hmm. Rose is, is very, very drinkable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, so there's a there's a certain level of IPA I think that you get to balance wise that I really really enjoy, and if it's just not that level of balance, I, I don't have time for it. Um, Caleb, tell us a little bit about the uh, brew pub, where it's located, what uh, what nights are the best to come, all of that. Um, the brew pub, we're, uh, we're located in Pearland. Um, we're open seven days a week. Just south okay. of Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's really easy to get to. Um, we're open seven days a week, Monday through Friday. It's 3 to 10. Um, and what day of the week does your like beer your beer of the week change? We normally um, put our new beer out every Thursday. Every Thursday, okay. Um, nice. We have some other special releases. You, um, like Saturday, we're releasing a Scotch Ale. Uh, that's new. Oh, now you're talking. <laughs> you saw Ian's eyebrow go up. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just if you uh, watch our Facebook page, mm-hmm. uh, we do we have trivia nights on um, Wednesdays. We're fixing to start a um, cornhole league. Nice. I love for those of you for those of you outside of Texas. Yeah. (laughs) Do people in other states? No, there's other people. No, no, there definitely is. Yes, yes. I have some uh, some uh, family in North Carolina, and they love cornhole. Okay, well then then I'll just leave it. And Californians are actually getting on the uh, the bandwagon. Can not, also be known as washers if you use a different game piece, so yes, to speak. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but you guys, uh, you guys have a league that uh, that comes. Yeah, in we're uh, we're fixing to start up a um, a league. It's uh, I think Father's Day is going to be the first tournament. Nice. And um, it's going to be a weekly thing. And uh, like I said, we have um, trivia night. We're going to start. We have uh, retro uh, video game tournaments. I mean, we just ha- we try to have fun. That's know? awesome. We're uh, very very dog friendly. Oh, so that's if you want to bring your dog yep. out, that's even better. Um, I think that it's. Uh, I, I love the fact that as the craft beer industry has grown and matured, that the focus has really kind of shifted, uh, particularly with newer and smaller uh, craft breweries, to what's happening at their location, yeah. at the tap room and and uh, at at the brew pub. Where do you see things going next? I mean, I think we've we've seen. 
so the way that craft beer has sort of evolved into this last couple of years is that first we had the uh, you know all the acquisitions, the guys getting bought up. Mm-hmm. Uh, then there seemed to be a focus very much on tap rooms and, and brew pubs. Mm-hmm. Now what we're seeing is the bigger guys who are still craft beer. So think Sam Adams, think Sierra Nevada. Um, these guys seem to be struggling a little bit if and to define struggling i would say just not growing as fast well and some of the some of the little guys are growing uh faster go ahead i think identity wise some of the bigger guys like that have a problem coming back down and feeling local right i think, I think that's right. a part yeah. of it i think, I, that's I think a you're part absolutely of it. right and there and there absolutely are and you're but, seeing mergers now like right. uh, sam adams and dogfish head right uh which i think Seems like it would be a good thing for both of those. Mm-hmm. Dogfish had to be good for them for distribution because Sam Adams really has got that part of the mm-hmm. equation nailed. And for Sam Adams, I think Dogfish Head makes them a, a little, little spice, a there. little more relevant in a fresh right, kind right, of a right. way, you know. So. Uh, uh, but uh, but where do you where do you see things going? Do you do you think any of these bigger guys may wind up out of the game? Um, I mean, it's definitely because growth, trying to find money to exp- right. you know expand and keep stay big. Mm-hmm. Um, I see things in the future getting more hyper local. Yeah, like uh, like us for instance. I mean, we're our tap room. You're uh, very much about Pearland, Texas, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we tr- we tend to do things that you know our people, our our right. patrons uh, want. Well, there's something to be said for being able to go down to the tap room that's just not so far away from it. It's close to your house. And that's yeah. your hometown, especially if they have good beer. You can be proud of that thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we all we all want to be proud of the things that are right around us that are our local stuff. Well, right, you know? because that's hometown. Our people, you know? right? That's hometown. It's our peeps, yeah. So I think when you have that, and then you have some small distribution around the area or even the state. I don't know how big your distribution is, but I see it uh, when I go to the grocery store. I mm-hmm. see your beers all the time. Um, which I think is great because then if, if I've gone to your tap room and go, that's great, I can pick some up here or maybe I just find it and go, that looks interesting. But I think there's that local pride that everyone has, like mm-hmm. for, your, for your high school pride or your, or your community pride or your, your city pride, those right. kind of things. Exactly. That, that when you put out a great product and you have a great place to hang out and you're good for the community, I think there's a large part of that that helps keep that whole, like yeah. you said, that local, that local brewery going. You know? I agree. I agree. I think uh, I think that's been one of the coolest developments of the whole craft beer mm-hmm. phenomena. With maybe the first being just how easy it is to find good beer now. Yeah. But I think the second is what it's meant for communities, for neighborhoods, even in in some cases. Like like inside the the city of Houston, uh, it can be about what what craft breweries in your neighborhood yeah. it's a few streets over that you can go and 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 hang out at the tap room and mm-hmm. and do that thing so um uh, you guys were a were a brew pub already so the beer to go ruling won't really change anything for it really you really doesn't right? affect us i yeah. think there was one thing with the beer and ale distinction mm-hmm. that might but other than that is the beer to ale distinction mostly an alcohol content well the thing is in texas um there's an ale lot before uh, before uh, there's an ale license which is um over five percent uh, okay and a beer is below five percent so you actually if you were a production brewery you had to you had to pay for two different licensing gotcha to mm-hmm. be pre- be able to produce something that's less than five or more okay so i'm so glad that you said that because i was trying to explain this uh about a week ago to a friend of mine and that's that's the line that i drew i think i, I said i think if it's below five it's beer and above, it's, right, it's, yeah. it has to be ale that's why you see yeah makes sense yeah makes sense. Sense. but i didn't know that there was a licensing distinction which makes sense because you know you can make more money if you have to buy two licenses and you're the state exactly and with the brew pub um we don't fall under any of those so we nice. can make what right. you know i think up to like 17 percent. as long as it's not over 17 percent, we're good <laughs> and people can take it home right yes um that that's the cool thing about us if you um you if uh, obviously our beers are available in stores mm-hmm. but you can also come to the brew pub and fill growlers we have a crowler machine we have six packs to go um so yeah distinction for people who don't know growlers are giant glass vessels mm-hmm. growlers are large cans that they will right. can for you right there mm-hmm. all right so uh so two more questions for me and uh ian just took took us right to the first one 
Um, you guys obviously can for what goes out to the stores. Mm -hmm. I realize this is more economic, uh, economically feasible for smaller breweries, and I love cans. particularly when, uh, uh, particularly when you can, uh, you know, do the wraps and stuff on mm -hmm. on lower runs cans and are stuff. Than bottles. So for somebody like me who's just uh, uh, clinging to the old school and and loves beer in a bottle. Should I just give it up? Is cans the way everything's going? As much as, like, cans are just easier to take places. You're not allowed Ian, Ian glass loves, everywhere. Ian loves cans, by the way. Cans are more portable. They uh, don't get any UV, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, no UV uh, um, impacts. Yeah. 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 Leakage. No. Yeah. So <laughs> corruption. It's not really Sorry. leakage, but so, yeah. Um, so there's, uh, they're, just, they're just more portable. Plus, uh, you know, it's a sealed unit. There was never a cap off of it, so to speak, right. until mm -hmm. like like once you put it on there, it's on there. It's not. I recognize all of, that. of the advantages um, of which you speak. They're my more. feeling, my feeling on if you see a brewery that puts out bottles and cans, they're only putting bottles out to take up face space in the grocery store. Really? Yeah. Really. Cans are the ultimate uh, packaging. And see, I thought it was for me because I got all excited when I saw St. Arnold Art Car IPA in bottles. Because it, I'd always seen it just in cans. I got so excited I bought it. Like, I immediately bought some. Like, I must support this this movement, you know, sort of a thing. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I guess it's so I've even about got, face space in, on the shelves. I've even mm -hmm. gotten to the point where if I see it in 12 packs in cans or bottles, I'll generally just buy the cans. Wow. Because, so frankly, at the house, I'm probably going to pour it into a glass anyway. Well, well and I'm, I'm going to do that with either one. I just like the bottles. But here's the other the thing. The can stack. Yeah, cans will stack. They go in coolers better. They do like so much. Probably are more so easily better. recyclable. I get it. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm just I don't know. I'm I'm old school like that. I, I, you I can't like shotgun a beer in a bottle either. I bet your friend Mark could. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone could do it, he would be the guy. And I think the can stigma that everyone used to have is starting <coughs> to it's, yeah. it's it's going away. You, you know what my primary thing is? I think uh, I I really like my beer cold. And if I'm in a situation where I'm not able to pour it into a glass and I'm drinking it out of the can, I usually don't enjoy that last ounce and a half. Well, you say a better koozie. Because it's gotten too warm. <laughs> well, actually, my wife bought me the Yeti Those one. Yeti koozies? So, there you go. And they're, they're pretty darn good. Of so course, they're a, little, they're a little sucky to keep in your pocket. But, yes, yes. But, man, they are effective. Mm -hmm. they, <laughs> are, they, are, they are effective. Uh, last question for you, uh, with this being your... You know your thing now. You're you're getting uh, into the saddle at uh, at Backfish. What is coming up? That what are you working on or dreaming about? That it's okay for you to uh, divulge. I think uh, mostly just playing around in our tap room. Um, we're gonna have some little kind of experimental type things. Uh, well, something you, you that mentioned a Scotch ale. That's that's yeah. definitely. I'm gonna have different. to come in yeah. next week because I'm, I'm gonna be in Austin. Saturday, yeah. so. Well, just let me know when you can come in. I'll make sure there's a Scotch Ale on tap. <laughs> <you know? laughs> See, this is samples and uh, at, you know uh, accessibility to the brewers. So I know you a can, guy. Yeah, so you can go. <laughs> I know a guy. There. But uh, <laughs> we're also about to add um, nitro taps to the to the uh, tap room. Really? Mm -hmm. and we're so, going to experiment mm -hmm. some with that. Uh, I've got a an English mild in the uh, pipeline that we're going to that's I think that might be our nice. first beer on the uh, how fun an English mild that now that's not something you hear about a lot I love when yeah. people go out and try styles that you just don't see that you just don't yeah. see yeah I yeah. love that but yeah just uh, if you watch our Facebook page and we'll announce whenever that's going to be tapped and uh, all the future stuff awesome I'll be uh, subscribing to your Facebook page yes here. absolutely <laughs> absolutely well uh, Ian you want to put in a vote for what did you say an ESB an ESB. Yeah, and, and I'll put a vote in for a hazy. I'd love to see okay. you guys do a hazy. Actually, idea. brewing one tomorrow for the tap oh, room. So. I see. I there love you this. Go. I love this. So. If I don't see an ESB coming down the pipeline, I'm going to get some sidewalk chalk and just paint the road in front of your house. <laughs> <laughs> Need an ESB. Uh, Caleb is with Backfish. They are in Pearland, Texas. And uh, I, I, I love, you know, one of the biggest things that I've taken from our conversation today is how important it seems to be to you guys to, no matter how widely distributed you become or what kind of uh, notoriety you begin to get that you really retain your identity as a local uh, brew pub. That's that, a big part. That of seems we, to really yeah. come through and I love that. I, I just think it's awesome. 
I think it's awesome. Community's well, king. Thank you, Caleb, for being on the show and for drinking tequila with us and uh, for, for bringing these wonderful uh, samples. I Thanks. think we pretty much loved everything. So Yeah, uh, great beer. So, uh, thank you. If you will just you know, put something on the can so that we can figure out when they're cold, I, I think it'd be. <laughs> I, I think would be your, your can, biggest can you fans ever. Vortex it, yeah, or, yeah. or what's what's the, uh, uh, an ingredient label? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Ian, do you have anything left in any of those open cans over there? Yes. Uh, pour There's me something. So I, can, I think I drink the rest of it. Pour me There's something so I can uh, toast you uh, out at the end of the show here. I want to thank you guys for being a part of uh, Smoking Toasting Number One Forty Two. Uh, uh, somewhere in my notes, I have what will be going on in next week's show, but I don't remember. So I think we'll just. <laughs> you know what uh, we're probably gonna do. We're probably going to drink and talk about uh, stuff. Uh, you know, I think that might be the case. I think that might be That's the gonna case. That's going to be our new like, yeah. tagline. Yeah. Smoking and toasting. We drink we and drink, talk, we about, talk stuff. about stuff. It's kind of what our intro says, actually, <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, thank you, John Egan, for that. Have a uh, great <laughs> week, my friends, and uh, we will see you back here next week for number 143. Smoking and toasting. Cheers. Back face. Man, I like that cheap sunglasses. So good, isn't it? You know what? Coming back to it, it's like there. Yeah, there. Yes.